So I'm going to call the meeting to order. The first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And I don't believe there were any changes. Does anyone um, have any objection to the agenda? OK, so we're going to consider the agenda approved um, without objection. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council um, on some topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would um, say your name, where you're from, and try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, that would be great. Um, and I know we have some folks, I think, for our general business appearances. So um, yeah, if you have something you'd like to say. As I didn't get this on the agenda, Donna Bate, Montpelier, I would really like to share before everybody disappears later in the evening, this walkable cities rule by Jeff Speck. Many of you may have seen him, I believe he might have been on VPR or someone interviewed him, but the book is incredible and I just have to read a couple things. One is, would you rather have a downtown that is quick to drive through or one worth arriving at? The other is that you need to do speed limits in districts, like downtown districts, which we've talked about a lot with our downtown uh, streetscape. And so I just want to bring out that people do understand speed limits, but you have to design the street to match what you want them to do. In Stockholm, they've done that. And in 2016, they had 16 car crashes. So street design is not just pedestrians and bikes, but car crashes. Phoenix, which is the same size of city, had 168. And so I think we can do it with good intentions of slowing people down, having them arrive, but meanwhile, the residents can enjoy a very safe place to be. So read the book. It's really worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Whitaker. Uh, we need to find new solutions for accountability. Uh, some of my public records requests are three months old. I know some of those, the, the oldest three month old one. No, the one for the records of conditions on city center bathrooms is older than three months. And there's about six of them piled up, and I keep getting manana next week, next week, next week, month goes by. It's not okay, Bill. They need to hold you accountable to adhere to public records law. I mean, I've, I've told you you've worn out my patience with extensions. Uh, accountability for street conditions, the sidewalks, Court Street, uh, the front steps of City Hall, ice, packed snow and ice. We're paying big dollars for public works maintenance. You need to hold people accountable to do a good job. It's dangerous. I was walking with a lady down Court Street today and just ice on the sidewalks. That's inadequate sanding. It's not, it's, not, it's not rocket science to fix. But many of the issues that I brought to your attention over years uh, get a nod and a jot and nothing happens. So there, you need to invent some mechanisms of accountability. Um, The other, I, I'm hoping t tonight is not your, what you're calling your public forum on the shooting. Uh, if it's just item seven on the agenda, there was not adequate public notice. Uh, and it needs to it, probably its own special meeting. Um, I'll leave you with those for right now. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Respond to all the requests this week? Um, that's something that he and I can talk about. I know, but that's been inadequate. So, so we're going to move on. Um, all right. Um, any other uh, general business and appearances? Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So on to the consideration of the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion? Just make a note so you all know what you're voting for here. <laughs> as far as the liquor license, I didn't put out which one it was. It's for they're both for Sodexo up at National Life Drive. They're the ones who serve the food up there, and it's a first and a third. So. Okay. 
I move the consent agenda with that uh, noted. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, okay, so we uh, have some appointments to make um, to students uh, on committees, which I'm particularly excited about. Um, and for some of these, there are uh, a few duplicates. Um, I think that there's um, at least one, or at least I think there's at least one committee where there's a, a duplicate. So we probably should go into executive session for that to just discuss it, I imagine. Um, I don't think I see any of the students here um, to uh, introduce themselves, if I'm wrong. Um, we'd love to hear from, from anybody. But uh, s um, so we have, um, gosh, I think I've, I don't have the list in front of me, but quite a few students for a handful of committees. Um, is there, I think we could probably just go right into an executive session for that. Is there a motion regarding that? I move that we enter ex executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3 yeah, oh, to discuss the appointment of a public officer. Second. Further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, well, we will be right back. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, all right, is there a motion uh, regarding the appointments? I have a motion. I think we're very pleased to see such a level of uh, interest, and I move make the following appointments for the tree board, Aaron Kelly, for the Homelessness Task Force, Alex Smart and Sophia Clark, for the Complete Streets Commission, Merrick Moden, and for the Energy Advisory Committee, Evan Rohan. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, I am particularly psyched that all of these students have stepped up to serve on these committees. This is really great. Um, they, yes, go ahead, Don. Do they get a notice from the city that they've been appointed and when their meet I don't group know. meets, etc.? Um, I imagine, uh, yeah. We'll send them something. Okay. Okay. Um, we have uh, an Emerald Ashbor update uh, from John Snell, who's here. Um, we're actually going to um, move one other item to right after that. I know there's a couple people here um, for the um, noise ordinance regarding um, dogs. We're going to move that to right after um, this item. I hope that's OK. Uh, all right. Uh, take it away, John. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I'm thrilled that we have students on the committees, too. We've been chasing that one for a while, and it'll be great to have their input and their per point of view compared to, you know, people with hair like this <laughs> or none <laughs> or none. Uh, I really appreciate a chance just to spend a few minutes with you and, and tell you what happened this summer with regard to Emerald Ash Borer and answer any questions that you have. You certainly have been great support in the past. and. Uh, we would not be where we are today without the support uh, that you've shown. Um, basically, it, over the last uh, nine months, our, our efforts have involved monitoring of the emerald ash borer, which, as you remember, showed up, up near National Life uh, for the first time over a year ago, educating the populace so that if this thing shows up again, we might find it uh, and... Uh, uh, so that people understand what the options are when, when it does show up, because it will. And being prepared. And uh, we've had some really great uh, opportunities and results there, which I'll go into in a little more detail. And then we're focusing on planting, uh, specifically planting the Greening Neighborhoods Program, where we planted trees all over the city. Uh, we started a new initiative this year where we're planting some of the smaller streams that feed into the Winooski uh, River. Uh, we uh, have upgraded the downtown trees again, and next summer we're already planning, I'm thrilled to say, to do some planting along the new tr river trail. So um, we did a lot of education, including um, pr making presentations at the Festival of Trees in February, which was attended by about three dozen people. Uh, we were here at City Hall uh, during town meeting day. Um, 
So a lot of what we do is through Facebook and uh, uh, just general uh, broadcasts to people in town is to let them know what to look for for Emerald Ash Borer, how to, how to, what should trigger them to call us and let us come out and do a bigger, uh, closer inspection, and what the options are for the future. Uh, when these trees do die, they become very expensive to cut down so that if we if a tree looks like it's going to become a danger We'd rather have them cut it down while it's still not infested uh, Makes great firewood as Glenn knows um, But we also don't want people just to wholesale cut down all the ash trees in the city Before there is a problem with them. So it's a it's a delicate balance of educating it turns out that uh, we had anticipated that this insect would show up in m many more places this summer. It, it did not, or at least we haven't found it. Um, there were three more ash trees up at National Life, the original site of infestation, that were infested. Those were taken down early in the spring and uh, chipped and burned. Uh, and we didn't find a single other emerald ash borer in all of the monitoring that we did around the city. So that's really good news. Um, it, it's, it, it doesn't mean that it isn't there. What it means is we didn't detect it. And uh, it may well be there. It certainly will be in the future because these things don't go away of their own accord. Uh, we did work with National Life uh, people, and they've been very cooperative in, uh, in strategizing with us in, in allowing us access to their properties and uh, discussions about what to do. So one of the things that you may remember is John Akhlesiak, who couldn't be here tonight, although he wanted to be, uh, wrote the, the preparedness plan and then the maintenance plan management plan and uh, that those plans have been utilized by a number of other communities in the state who haven't yet had the EAB infest their towns but it's eminent and so there are, many of them are using the plans that we prepared in order to be prepared themselves. So monitoring was, as I said, a big part of what we did, and part of that was putting these 10 uh, green prism traps around the city. You may have seen them in various locations. And the idea is that there, there's a, um, an attractant in them. The insects come to them, get stuck in the goo that's on the outside of them, and then uh, Adam McCullough can get up there in his bucket truck and take a close look at what has been trapped. And it, it, again, it turned out there were, there were some false positives, but no positive EAB were found in any of them. So we taken the traps down, cleaned them up. They're ready for deployment again next spring. Uh, and you know, we'll see what we see. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, as part of monitoring, took a second look at over 450 ash trees on city rights of way around throughout the city. Uh, these are trees that we identified in the inventory. We went back and looked at all of them again and determined that none of them were showing the classic signs of infestation. A d two dozen were flagged as possible suspects and we got up close to those with the bucket truck and were able to determine that there was not a problem with any of them. Uh, the traps were all checked monthly. We feel pretty good that if something had been out there, we would have found it. But like I said, it's not a guarantee. Excuse um, me, John. Um, yep. You found you, those 450 trees were checked. Do you, could you remind us what the estimate is for the number total number of ash trees in the city? Uh, well, I in the parks, it's about 600, uh, and uh, on the rights of way of streets, it's about the same. So that's that's a pretty. C c you looked at a pretty good chunk of what's out there. We did. That's good Absolutely. news. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll continue to monitor those on an annual basis. Now that we know where they are and you know which ones are relatively easy to get to, it it it's pretty straightforward to do that. And we look for some pretty classic visual signs uh, of what's going on. 
one of the other uh, focuses was um, was to to be prepared, and and I think this is a an area in which we had really great success, and in large part again because of your support of uh, what we had proposed in hiring uh, an arborist, Adam McCullough, and he has been just a remarkable asset to us. Um, he has uh, um, worked pretty tirelessly on his own and has uh, overseen a lot of work by other parks people so that they really learned from him how to, to deal with the trees. Uh, he estimates that he's put in uh, f 243 tree work hours specifically and uh, supervised uh, almost 500 other hours by other people. So that's been something we just didn't have before and it's made a big difference. Uh, he again estimates that his work has been had a value of about $35,000 had we had to uh, farm it out otherwise. <clears throat> Specifically, he took down seven ash trees, but the big one for us in terms of being prepared is that he dealt with the backlog of other trees that were problems, uh, almost 80 other trees. And some of these were really significantly uh, um, hazardous, potentially hazardous trees. So they're down, they're out of the way. Now we can really focus our efforts on uh, on other trees. He took down uh, over 40 dead pine trees, the red pines that are uh, on the state house path going up to, to the tower. Uh, those have all lived their normal life cycle and yet they're coming down, you know, willy nilly in big storms. So we need to get those out and he did that. The other thing that is really important in terms of uh, the future is being able to treat some of the ash trees with uh, a pesticide so that when the insect does land on them, it it's killed. And we, we had brought this up with you before and gotten the okay to do it. Uh, so we're using a systemic uh, pesticide, uh, emamectin benzoate, and uh, uh, Adam uh, and Alec uh, Ellsworth were both trained and certified by the state to uh, apply this insecticide themselves. It allowed us to reduce our costs by about two thirds, and they've treated uh, over 20 of the big ash trees in the downtown area so far. That protects the tree positively. It allows us to buy a little time, as much time as we want, really, uh, to grow new trees around them. So I'm really thrilled about that. One of the things that's in the plan for next year is to treat other street trees around town. And we'll come back to you uh, or to Bill with some further thoughts on this because I don't want to step on the toes of private enterprise, but I do want to make sure that trees that are part of the, basically the neighborhood uh, view are treated if, if they have value. Um, and there's plenty of them that are and sometimes the cost of treatment is gonna be uh, a barrier to having that done by private enterprise. So what we're gonna propose is that uh, Adam uh, do the treatment of these trees uh, as part of our tree board budget. Uh, just a question about the treating yeah. the trees. You didn't give us a number of how many trees they treated? And at one point you had estimated when we gave you a budget. Okay. You, do you remember what that we was? We did 23 trees so far this year. And how many could you do? That's, those are the 23 trees downtown and a couple up in the park. Um, I'm going to guess that the next round, next year, treating some, other, some of the other sort of prominent street trees, we easily do that many or double that many next year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to share with you a st one of the stories of a Adams having tr uh, dealt with these um, hazardous trees. There's a, a pretty noted tree on summer and spring tree. Um, it's a huge uh, white pine tree, it's a beautiful tree, and it's, it's right on the street. And a lot of people have thought, well, that tree's too big. You know, it's a danger. And trees can end up that way. Rather than cut it down, he uh, 
took some of the upper limbs out of it. Basically, it makes it a lot less likely to be blown over. And what he said was that he was up climbing at a height of 60 feet. I love this guy. Uh, <laughs> the limb that he cut off in order to reduce the wind sail effect had 50 years worth of growth on it. Wow. So 60 feet up, it had grown for 50 years. Um, and I, I think having the ability to deal with trees like that is worth a lot to us as the tree board. Um, we also met with Green Mountain Power. Some of you may have seen uh, some green markers on trees around town. Green Mountain Power is, has hired a crew and a really excellent supervisor to flag trees that are in the rights of way or that if they, the ash trees, if they do fall, they'll damage lines or take lines down. So we don't know exactly how many it's gonna be, but it's uh, at least a couple hundred trees that will come down. We're paying for it. I noticed on my power bill that I paid six cents, <laughs> six cents for the Emerald Ash Borer Initiative. So we're all paying a little bit and we're getting this taken care of so that it doesn't take people off, off, uh, off grid. And uh, we worked with them and shared information uh, and I think that's been very successful. So the bottom line is though, even though we did not find additional uh, infestations, I think we're in a great place to deal with it when it does come and that's inevitable. Uh, it's not a question of if it's gonna come, it is gonna come, it is here and uh, we're ready for it and we really appreciate the support that you've given us. Any questions that I can answer? I only have questions you can't answer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Donna. Just lots of, lots of thanks. I mean, I'm glad we have the tree professional, but without the tree board, yourself and everyone, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. So you and John and, and the rest pushed us. So thank you. Well, Invaluable. you're welcome. Uh, Glenn. Uh, I, All right. I, I also just wanted to pull out one thing, John. Yeah. Um, that I'm pleased to see that uh, it looks like the trees taken down by um, Green Mountain Power, if the landowner doesn't want that firewood, it will go to the Parks Department. That's right. And the Parks Department will do firewood distribution. Yep. So I'm really pleased to see that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great. And then, you know, they've done that with some of the other ones that they've removed. So, yep. I guess the one other thing I glossed over and what would just beg to take a moment to come back to is planting. <coughs> we planted uh, last spring over 150 trees uh, around town as part of our greening neighborhoods program where we ask people can we plant a tree in your front yard and it's uh, if they're agreeable we really work with them to find the right location and the right species that's going to make a difference to the whole neighborhood so there's 150 new trees in just this spring alone and it, it's amazing to look back over the last five years that we've been doing this and see these things now 20 or 30 feet tall. Uh, I'm really thrilled about that. We also were able to replace six trees downtown that were struggling or had died. Two of them had been hit by snow plows. Uh, and we got an incredible gift from a nursery uh, one of our tree board members works with. And uh, they donated three trees and gave us a 50% discount on three more. So it was really, it made things possible that would not have been easy otherwise. There, were, there was a disappointment in that there was a miscommunication um, with DPW. Uh, I can blame Tom because he's not here anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I, I will own this one too. I'm not sure how it happened, but he and I ended up at cross communications about getting three new tree wells in the downtown area. And uh, we were not able to do that. Um, Corey and I tried to pull it out at the last minute, but it just wasn't gonna work. So I'm aiming to get six new locations uh, next year since we missed three this year. And those will fill in the gaps as the ash trees downtown do uh, die. So thank you very much. If you do have questions at any point,
please just drop me a note or pick up the phone. Uh, Jack and Donna. Yeah. Last time we were talking about this, there was some, it, it wasn't clear what uh, species would be the uh, right species to put downtown because the ash trees have done so well and we haven't found anything that has done as well. Where, what are you thinking now for species for downtown? We're using a mix for starters, you know, after the elm, elm problems and, and ash problems and other problems, a monoculture is just a d disaster. Mm -hmm. We've had great results with ginkgos. Uh, they're all male ginkgos. They're cloned male ginkgos so that they don't produce fruit, uh, which some people have problems with. Um, but we are also using hackberry uh, Freeman maples have done very hmm. well, uh, but I don't want to overplant those. The, there's four Freeman maples in front of Shaw's that we planted about 10 years ago, and those trees have done very well despite pretty adverse conditions there. Um, so let's see, th those two, we um, we've have lindens, uh, some uh, honey locusts. So those are pretty so much the mix, ones. Yeah. That we do. There's a bunch of oaks over by the credit yes. union. Thank you, oaks too. Yeah, and we put oaks in sidewalks, and they're doing very well. There's one right at the corner of East State and Main uh, that is doing really, really well. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Not done. Well, yeah. Being a photographer, I want to know if you have a tree album. So you, when you put them in, you take a picture when they're little, and then as they grow. And if you don't, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of pictures See, of And you can trees. bring those trees back to the city council next time you need some more money. We, <laughs> we, do, we do have a uh, trees uh, Facebook page that's doing very well. And a lot of times oh. those trees show up there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Look. Yep. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank I you. Appreciate Thank it. you so much, John. Okay, so we are going to uh, skip to the uh, animal and noise ordinance. So for this, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Donna to um, sort of introduce this. And, and actually, meanwhile, I'm going to run to the bathroom. So <laughs> Ashley, I think you're running the show. Okay. Uh, all right. So I, gonna, I I'm going to yeah. pass it to you, Donna. I put this on the agenda and became more aware of it because of some comments and complaints from my constituents on Elm Street. And it seemed a very reasonable request that the only thing on the books when a, a dog began barking was that the dog had to bark for 20 consistent minutes. And they dutifully recorded this dog who barked often, chronically, persistently throughout the day and throughout the week, but never for 20 minutes consistently. So the goal here is just to add th that aspect of something different than 20 consistent minutes. I don't know that it's perfect, but what we put here and try to put it in line with what's also in the noise er ordinances is that a nuisance means any dog that chronically disturbs the quiet, comfort, and repose of others by barking, whining, calling, howling for three or more times throughout the day for three or more days within the week. So we're not talking about a little yap here or there, but something that's chronic persistent. And we thought that three, day, three times during the day, three or more days during the week, that that would be a high enough standard. And I know that we have some people here to talk about their experiences. Would you like to, you can sit at the table or speak at the mic. Hello. Sure. Oh. Sit. Right I should. It. I should just sit down. Yeah, which, I, either one, whichever you prefer. Whatever you're more comfortable. You got to talk right into sure it there too. <laughs> um, Cheryl Repay Adams and Chris Adams on Elm, right near Cummings. And uh, since we moved there, a nearby neighbor has. Uh, originally, there were two hounds and howled constantly. 
except for rarely more than 20 minutes. And uh, then they died eventually, and that was sad, but we were glad also of the quiet. <laughs> and they, they got another dog, and, and the puppy was fine, but then after a while, it started up again, because apparently hounds are a, like a, what they want, and, and hounds howl. And so we don't really know what to do, because we've called and we're told by the police that if we ended up in um, small, uh, what was it, court? I don't remember, small, small claims, claims court, is that right? Yeah. Um, that the judge would just say, well, the dog has to go out. If the dog is out, the dog is barking and howling. And it's many times a day. It was 6 a.m. Sunday. It was 11 p.m. Sunday night or Monday night. Just that it's just that it's pretty constant from early morning till late night on a regular daily basis. Doesn't matter that what the day is, it's every day. It just goes on and on. I go to open the window a quarter of eleven at night, dogs bark when we're getting in bed. And this dog is not as aggressive. Actually there's two there now. The two before it, one of them, not only would he howl and sound like a like a banshee, it was amazing. But he would, if you went anywhere near their fence, he would throw himself at the fence and yell and scratch and bark and it got to be annoying after a while. It was difficult to converse in the garden. Yeah. Like we'd have to wait for it to stop before people could hear each other talking. So now that doesn't happen, but it's just the continual, bar it's the same barking time frame over and over. It's just, um, it's tiresome, actually. A, a neighbor came to us looking for the source of it, uh, somebody who lived across the river on Cummings and uh, had suffered for many months and didn't know where it was coming from. And so we wondered how many people over on Cummings are hearing that and not knowing. It's an echo valley where we live. Um, so I didn't walk over there and knock on doors yet, but that could be something if it would help to have more statements from people. Well, I received two complaints from Cumming Streets and three from Elm. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything more you want to know from us? And that's without soliciting any. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, well, I wasn't here for the thing, but. I'm set. Thanks. Thank you. I'm open for any questions. So, oh, go ahead, Ashley. Well, I don't know if you were making like a larger. Well, um, I have a couple ideas, but what are your thoughts? Sure. Go for it. Um, well, the the first thing that comes to mind, like I've worked with, I, I work with humans, but you know, when when there is a, a human, generally a tiny one that cries a whole bunch, it's an unmet need of, of some sort, and you know, I um, I'm glad to see that there's no spelled out you know, like we're gonna take your dog or anything like that. But the the sort of first thing that stands out to me is um, I don't really love fines. I don't know that those are a super effective way. They are pretty regressive, but I'm wondering if right up front, we could front load the CJC process so that we can like bring people in. And I understand that that's not something that everyone is comfortable doing, but um, I find that facilitating conversations about things that are super problematic like this, um, for me at least, that's a, a sort of preferred place to start as opposed to... It's here. No, I know, but it, it's a second offense. And so there's the, the formal warning, which, you know, yes, we need... We, people need to be warned about those things. Um, but in, in terms of the second, third... and fourth or subsequent offenses, I, I would really just like to see like a referral to the CJC in that first thing so that if there is um, an animal that is reported, that is a problem, it's something that the city can sort of reach out in a collaborative way before getting to, you know, to this point. And the other thing is that, um, you know, I, I, I guess I could see a set of circumstances under which those circumstances may actually um, arise to criminal liability also and so um you know i know that that's not sort of what anyone is looking for here but it is something that you know can be addressed there are um criminal laws that can also work on addressing 
you know, people and their either neglect of their animal's needs or just whatever is going on. But I would, the only, I, I am fine with this. I would just ask that the CJC part be like front loaded and maybe like the city can try to collaborate on a solution to address this. But um, I, I would imagine it's quite frustrating to, to have to listen to, um, but I just want to be mindful that the, the dog isn't necessarily the one to blame always. Um, so I want to step back for a second and talk about the process, because I think, I, I don't know, how do, you, how do you feel about that suggestion? Yeah, yeah, no, fine. I mean, okay. when, when the police were called, they did recommend mediation, okay. and they were asked for it, but they weren't forced for it, so therefore they didn't do it. So you're right. So um, just uh, taking a step back, my um, guess is that uh, the l language that we have in front of us right now, we're going to need to massage or craft into um, um, uh, either, you know, we just add this. I, I mean, I have some questions. Um, so one possibility is that we just take some comments tonight and then uh, maybe direct staff to come back with <coughs> um, a, like a compilation of our suggestions. Is that, does that sound reasonable, Don? Um, does that, that sounds okay to you? That's fine. I'd just like to quickly address the, um, the part that Ashley brought up, which is that this entire process was in, in added to this ordinance just a couple years ago when we did a lot of work on the dog ordinance and we had a dog committee and this was, this was the process that that committee identified and the council endorsed. So the idea, you know, we can't necessarily impose CJC, so the, the, I think the thinking was you offer it in lieu of a fine so that a person can go through that process, but if they don't, uh, if, they just wa if you say you've got to do it and they walk away, um, then the fine was sort of the incentive for them to participate. So, I mean, obviously you, you're welcome to change that, but this was a fairly um, vetted and, and I think linked discussed not only uh, for a long time in committee, but then I think in multiple occasions here with the council. So I uh, just want to remind everyone of that. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Donna, this um, uh, is th this is really about uh, the, the two ordinances, right? The noise control ordinance and uh, the dog control ordinance, right? It's sort of bringing them into alignment. Right. Yeah. That was the intention, because okay. when you went to the noise ordinance, there was no standard. They just said if they did this and this, they were a nuisance. Yeah. And you could get them through the noise, but you couldn't through here. Okay. Um, Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker. The, uh, <laughs> since you're not only dealing with noise, you're dealing with animal ordinance, uh, I'm not sure if it's city jurisdiction that's supposed to enforce the animals in restaurants but we've got a problem where it's become fashionable, trendy, tolerated, and even encouraged to bring animals into food service establishments, and it's getting out of hand. Dogs are barking, dogs are jump, a dog is jumping up into the cooler, hands on the counter, staff is coming out and massaging the dog and going right back to work without washing their hands. It's, it's out of control, and I'm not gonna name establishments, but, um, I'm not sure if it's city or state health department that has to enforce that. I think our health officer would know whether the police should be called to cite somebody for bringing, and the ambiguity over whether a dog is a service animal has become a game. So a merchant will advise the person to say it's a service animal in training. It, it's not a service animal, it's a, it's a toy. You know, it's, it's a, you know, a guy magnet or whatever it is, but the dogs, in order to qualify as a service animal, have to be, have been trained to perform a function for someone who needs that. There's a legal tr briefing I can share if anybody would read it who wants to read it. But same way I defend handicap parking against abusers of people who are not handicapped, I will defend keeping animals out of restaurants. So I would hope you would find a way to take either action to amend the ordinance to make it uh, very clear and or enforce it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any uh, other, yes, Jack. 
I, I think this is a, a good approach, a good way to get going. I, I know in, uh, in, in, in general, in terms of people who are asked to enforce a standard, they like to have something very objective and uh, <coughs> easily measured. And I s assume that's partly why the 20-minute thing came out, because uh, people don't want to be in a position of exercising judgment that then they say, in my opinion, it's this, and the other person says, no, I disagree. Um, but I think that this is a way to uh, address it without getting too much into uh, uh, a lack of standards. And so I think we should be uh, proceeding to, uh, I don't know if we're ready to schedule a public hearing. Uh, I want to have the city come back with the draft language first, but I, th I think this is a good thing to be doing. Uh, Connor. Can I just ask where they, the three times a day language came from? Was that, was that from like another ordinance in another city or? No, we were just thinking of what was trying to be a real irritant versus just once a day, twice a day. But three times seemed to be like, okay, now I'm irritated. <laughs> But, but you're, you're flexible on that? Yes, okay. yes. Um, on that note, I was, uh, well, Donna and I have talked about this a little bit, but I, um, just the way it's phrased right now, I think if any dog barks three times in a day, then this would trigger this uh, ordinance, and I think that's probably not the intent. Three um, times a day for three or more days during the week? If it goes together. Sure, for, so if a, do if a dog barks, just three times in a day, and then does it for three days. Is that considered chronic? Okay. Right, like that. Yeah. That to me seems too much, um, but I understand the intent, and so I think there's probably just a way to rephrase it, I guess, or re rephrase three it. Times so is, if that, if it's okay, if we can kick that to staff. We yes, Donna. I did receive recordings, and I'd be glad to share them, particularly with staff. Because when you listen, you get an idea what a minute means or two minute means when somebody's a dog, you know, is really howling, whining. Um. Glenn. Um, as a dog owner, I think uh, I think if we said three times for a minute in a day, th three times a week, that would be just fine. My dog probably barks uh, three times a day because we have someone come to the door that often but she stops immediately once she figures out who it is you know and I think that's okay she it, it's not so much inside it's being out in the yard where the sound goes that's the issue but, but I understand yeah. Yeah. anyway so so we'll have staff work on it mm -hmm. yeah uh, Ashley I, I guess I've, I'm thinking about this and I've been thinking about this for a while. It just, it feels to me like we are, I know what the issue is, which is how do we get this particular situation to resolve in a way that meets everyone's needs. It just feels like, you know, regulating the number of barks that a dog can have. I mean, and you know, I don't have kids, but like, I could see a world in which someone were upset about a, a child crying or about a anything else. And, and I want to address these issues and I want to address, you know, this because it is a problem. You know, I've had neighbors with dogs that bark before, but I don't know that setting a, a limit on the number of barks or, or, or something like that is, is really the way to solve this because I, this is, you know, we don't just deal with dogs barking, we deal with you know, other noise related issues. And I know that, you know, having, having, you know, if it happens this number of times for this many days, I mean, if there's one extra bark, I mean, right, like, and I, I, I appreciate that this sounds a bit facetious, but I also want to be pragmatic that if the goal is actually to address the issue and to rectify that, um, I don't know that setting a limit on the number of barks per day, you know, my partner's dog probably barks more than that, but he sees cats in the house, you know, and or, you know, he sees a squirrel outside. And again, I know that's not the situation that we're talking about. I would just encourage us to sort of think outside the box and, and instead of, 
picking a number or you know maybe the issue is a, a dog being left um, unattended or unsupervised or or something like that and I just I wonder if there is um, a way that would get to the heart of the issue which is the the unmet needs of an animal who's trying to communicate that um, in, in a way that you know isn't sort of r related to this time frame or this number of minutes because whether it's three minutes or whether it's 20 minutes, if it's three minutes every 20 minutes, I mean, you know, it, it, it adds up either way or whether it's, you know, 55 seconds every 20 minutes or it just, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I will think on it and I would, I'm gonna try to come back with something that gets to the same result in just a way that, that feels a little more focused on what the actual issue is as opposed to like the best way that we can quantify it right now. Okay, any other comments on this? I don't think we need a motion at this point, um, but we'll just put it on the agenda for some future meeting, like maybe the next you, one. So you could, like, the staff, uh, I don't Would you like a motion about that? I, I just no. want to be clear. So you would, like, uh, you would like us to draft this in ordinance language and recommend maybe we can look at what some other communities are doing to, to deal with this and yeah. come back as yeah. soon as reasonable. Great. Is, Is that, that uh, no? Yeah, maybe just uh, a ballpark idea of how long this process is likely to take for the sake of uh, um, the folks who've come out mm -hmm. this evening. Um, and I'm just going to throw a guess out there, and you can correct me, but if, if we come back to it and then there are the... the uh, recommended two public hearings, the required pu two public hearings, and we end up passing something, we're talking about a couple of months fastest, probably. Probably, yeah. So, yeah, um, just so you know, when nothing happens for a while. Well, my, <laughs> my guess is that having something back by next week, because we meet next week, is probably too fast. Yes. And but then, but December's if we... We'll shoot for December. I was going to say, if we aim for December 11th and then 18th, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we were thinking December okay. at the earliest. Yeah. All right, great. All right, well, oh, Lauren. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming out tonight and thank Donna for doing the work on drafting this and putting this forward, and I definitely appreciate the city staff taking some of the consideration of, um, I agree, I think some massaging um, to make sure we're solving this problem but not creating a whole new slew of, um, of dogs that become problem dogs overnight that nobody's really, <laughs> um, but, but really trying to get at the, the core of this real nuisance. Um, so look forward to that and thank you again. Thanks, Donna. Yes, you're working thank on you. this. Yeah. Okay. Um, nope, not, that's not our function right now. Uh, all right, so um, all right, so we are moving on to um, the police officer involved shooting uh, discussion. So this was a, a time that we wanted to um, just let the the public, if they had um, thoughts or issues or questions, um, that now would be an okay time to raise that. Um, and I know we have um, Chief Fakus here to um, uh, hear hear the questions. I mean, we um, thought we would. Maybe just like write down like what are the things that people are concerned about, um, and uh, see if we can process all of that to to get uh, answers. Though they, they may not be tonight, um, but in any case, uh, so this is a, an opportunity for uh, the public to discuss that. Uh, so uh, yeah, go ahead, Steve. So. I'm Ill, not as prepared as I'd like to be because I still don't have the records I asked for back in August. I understand they were legitimately withheld while the investigation was going on. The investigation was completed weeks ago and the records have not been produced. The incident reports, the schematics of who was where, distances, et cetera. Um, none of that, those records have been produced. Um, all I've got was an email from Jamie with the video link. That's it. Um, I don't know if we have all of the investigation reports. What's that? We know it's the, the state police still have a full, full record. And I know the, the, the state's attorney linked everything to, uh, the state's attorneys released everything to. Um, well, whatever was created here in Montpelier, I was due uh, as yeah. soon as it was released from the 
Yeah, well, Chuck, so, I think we gave you everything because they took over the investigation immediately. But you've still got copies of your officer's reports. On the DSP, Vermont State Police investigation. Report. But you have your copies here. Um, so uh, I'd right. like to just uh, pause on, on the dialogue. If you would like to I'm asking for the to, copies that I requested. I'm still talking. So okay. if you would like to just say whatever you would like to say, um, and then um, we may respond um, sort of together. Does that make sense? So just, let's, let's just take okay. a turn. So, so it's, yeah, go ahead. I would, I would ask that this be, this is not a, a 10 minute agenda item. This is a public hearing that needs to be scheduled for the broader community. It needs to be widely advertised ahead of time, uh, possibly even a special meeting, because this is a very serious thing. A second, you know, killing of a mentally disturbed person uh, unnecessarily. And when I've watched the video, as I said at the last time you took this up, I watched the video, the, the vocals between the officers, they clearly, he's waving that thing around. They're not feeling fear. They could tell the guy is, would rather jump off the bridge, you know, but they talk him down and then they kill him. I mean, that is absolutely unnecessary. There's no discussion of, hey, should we get mental health over here? Maybe how do we just cool our jets a little bit? But let's take the guy out. You know, who's next, me? You know, this, this is very serious. And you, we need to not try to sweep it under the rug or allow the, the officers to sweep it under the rug. I understand that technically it's a justified shooting because he had a weapon that couldn't have been known. But fearing for their lives, you know, that guy could, with a pistol could not hit. They're back there behind a cruiser, probably have the rifle steadied on a cruiser. They're in no danger from a pellet gun or even if it was a pistol, you know? So to take this guy out was a gross overreaction, you know, an abuse of, uh, abuse of police power. And I'm not suggesting that we fire this guy and send him down to, to another parish like the Catholics do, but he needs, you know, maybe not have gun privileges for a while, you know, or maybe be taught to train other people how not to take somebody out unnecessarily. But this is not something we can sweep under the rug, you know. This is unconscionable. This is not the city we want to live in, where people get shot randomly because, you know, a poor training of a police officer. And where did the shotgun go? You know, I, I, I called that last time. Jack asked, why wasn't the shotgun, the beanbag shotgun used? And Bill says, I'll talk to you about that. So was that intentional to not create a paper trail? Where's the discussion? Those records were requested a long time ago. Why was the shotgun not used? Are you, thank you. Let's, um, I'd like to pause and see if there's any other comments. Any other thoughts from the public? Okay. Um, would you like to I'll just briefly say that the reason I asked to speak with Jack was because it was complicated and didn't want to write it all out. It wasn't to, to do anything. I'd also say that the issue of the, I assume you mean the beanbag, the non-lethal beanbag, was addressed in pretty much good detail by the state's attorney in his statement, which is available to be seen and written. He addressed that. It was not on the scene. There were no other officers on scene, uh, no others in the only officers at that time were Barry City, who had been called to respond. So it would have required leaving the scene to get the, uh, the non-lethal shotgun. Uh, the, the officers were responding to a felony of a person. Uh, the report was a, you can doubt all you want. The report was for a person attacking someone with a knife. That's the call they were re responding to. Now, you know, you can know what you know after the fact. This is what they knew at the time. Uh, so they responded immediately and were on scene. So there was no opportunity to get the other weapon. Uh, it, was, it wasn't in, in play. And as I said, State's Attorney addressed that in pretty great detail in the press conference, which you can see live and in his written statement. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, anything you want to um, add to that, Chief Akis? If not, that's fine. No, that's fine. OK. Any other comments from Council? Uh, Connor. I, I mean, I, I would say I walk past the memorial every day, and it's like indisputable that this was a tragedy for our community, especially one so small. And you could tell um, really just how deeply everybody felt about Mr. Johnson. But at the same time, there were two separate investigations, both of which 
exonerated these officers. And I think I would take issue that we would vilify our police force. Um, they're like any other employees in city government here. And just because you put on the badge doesn't forfeit your right to defend yourself or your partner when they have families at stake. And I, I have a different interpretation watching that video. I, I could hear fear in their voices, uh, fear for their own lives there. Um, and, and to say they were safe behind the vehicle, those doors were paper thin there. Um, if a shot had been fired, um, they absolutely would have been in danger. And I, I think we can have criticism on the national level for how police officers act. And uh, certainly they should be accountable when they are. Uh, but I've really appreciated uh, how our police department operates as far as the trainings they take part in. And I, I, I think they're second to none in the state as far as the work they do. So I, yeah, I, I think there's a tendency to vilify people just because they're cops here, but they're employees of the city. And it was an independent investigation, not by the city here, that found them innocent in this case. Okay, when the state we, uh, police, we are, we're, um, we're going to move on. The state um, so, police objected so, to him reviewing you, the video before. All right. You're overlooking that. You're sweeping it under the rug. Thank you, Stephen. All right, so uh, we are going to move on. And actually, I'm going to change the order one more time um, because I know there are some folks here for the responsible uh, employer ordinance that are here so dutifully every time um, we uh, take this issue up and uh, I know they're also here from far away so um, uh, so yeah we're, is it okay Connor if we jump to, uh, to that great okay uh, do you want to say anything more about I this don't have a ton to say I think we're at the sixth uh, <laughs> hearing for this <laughs> Uh, so we, we vetted it pretty well. I, I appreciate everybody who's come out uh, pretty diligently for all these hearings. Um, I think we have an opportunity to really set a landmark ordinance in this case that would be a beacon for the rest of the state and hopefully New England and the region here uh, to set the example that we treat our construction workers with the respect they deserve and try to pre pre prevent wage theft, uh, misclassification. Misclass and uh, discrimination, as Daniela said several times here. So I'm hoping we can pass this tonight, and uh, I really appreciate everybody's time on it. Do I hear a motion? I would move well, to, uh, excuse me. Yes, this is a public hearing. We're so, the public yes, hearing now. Yes, so I'm gonna officially open the public hearing. Um, <laughs> and she was doing so yes. well. <laughs> I know, uh, yeah, and then, and then we'll take motions afterwards. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hello again, Danielle Bombardier from Colchester, and I just want to say thank you um, for City Council for, for looking at this and for hopefully passing it tonight. Um, I think it's a really great step forward, as Connor said, for the state of Vermont, and will be an example um, when we go to Burlington, South Burlington, Winooski, Colchester, and on and on throughout the state. So I appreciate all that you have done. Thank you, Connor, and thank you all. Any other comments? Okay, I'm gonna officially close the public hearing. Um, Connor, yeah. would you like to make a motion? So, recommended action schedule second public hearing. I think we are at the second public hearing, right? Yes, we just had it. I just closed it. Okay. So, so we'll you can actually we'll pass it to me. Okay. So <laughs> I, would <Stop. laughs> yeah. I would move to pass the responsible employer ordinance. Second. Uh, I have that one language tweak that I would like to add as an <laughs> amendment to the the motion. Uh, it was I, I read it out last meeting, but it didn't make it into the language. So um, I can read it out again if you like. That was good. Yeah. Shall I read it out again, or are you just going to accept? Okay. Well, well, no. <laughs> okay. I feel like yeah. federal. Okay. <laughs> national politics has taught me I never agree to anything that I don't know what it is. Okay. I'll read it out. <laughs> that's right, Ashley. I don't think you. I don't think He's you were here. That's, that's right. right. He's read. I, I wasn't. I, I wasn't so here. The, the issue is that the motion, the art, uh, the, the ordinance was passed at first reading with the amendment, and just because we had people out sick, um, we didn't get it changed in, in here. So, so the, the so text I, is not correct. The text but on we here is the same as what was passed as it was passed okay. the last meeting. So I think you could either just amend it and pass it again with that or just say you're passing it as similar as passed, as passed at first reading. First time. Um, you nonetheless, do you, you want to just so Ashley can hear what you 
So okay. it's not a change. Yep. This was this was uh, section six four. Um, I deleted some language saying, it's as calculated in accordance with Vermont's prevailing wage law, because that's uh, a redundant reference. Uh, the language as it as I uh, amended it is. Section 6.4, the bidder or proposer and subcontractors under the bidder or proposer must comply with the obligations established by the city for payment of a responsible wage, which shall effectively incorporate the rates set under the Vermont prevailing wage law applicable to the regional rates for the Montpelier area, including the appropriate apprentice classification. Yeah? That, that came up. W yeah, it came back a couple of times ago. Yeah, not okay. the last one, but the one before that. Yeah, okay. That one. That's the one that I want without the redundancy. We okay. don't need any more departments of redundancy, redundancy <laughs> departments. So you all then are doing the move to pass responsible employer ordinance as amended in the first hearing? That's yes. Okay. So that's what you all intended, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you uh, for bringing this up. Thank you for all of Thank your you. work on this, and uh, good luck um, in the future endeavors. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for coming so many times. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. You must know all our local issues by now. <laughs> we just like going to eat it. Sir, How do you feel about right. dogs? <laughs> I just want to say on behalf of every construction worker in the state of Vermont and New England and probably the United States, you folks have been on the foundation of something that's going to help them all, and uh, we appreciate it much. And yeah, I think we're going to come back to meetings because I want to see what happens to the ash borer. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, the snowplow budget, and see if you hire anybody else. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I had a lot of dogs, so that's kind of sensitive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we are um, up to the, um, what I think is our last regular business item, which is um, the uh, recreation building uh, update. Um, do you, you have a presentation? We do. So do you want to take like a two minute break and set everything up and we'll um, re reconvene when you're ready. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Over here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, since we have this presentation. So I'm going to sit down here. Um, so if you, uh, actually, Bill, do you have anything to say about I'm this? I'm going to turn this right over to Cameron. Okay. He's letting me introduce this. Great. Um, Go ripping it. off the Band-Aid early. So <laughs> Council and um, Mayor Watson, thank you so much for letting us be here. I'm excited to bring you some of the plans for um, potential changes to our recreation facility. Um, I know that this conversation begun or began when um, we discussed the building being unaccessible and non-ADA compliant, which doesn't allow us to serve our community to the best of our abilities. Our rec center is an invaluable part of our community and it serves a lot of folks and our rec center does a lot of really good work for our community, including daycare um, and really great athletic programs for our community and in a substandard building. Um, so this um, really came out of that conversation, making sure that we are ADA compliant and then making it better. Um, so it doesn't stop just there. Um, you'll be seeing tonight two different options, a base option and an upgraded option. Those were um, shown to us today, so we don't have necessarily staff recommendations at this time but we are hoping to show you this presentation, give you the information, and then bring it to a vote next, next meeting, next week, to see if we wanna bring this to a bond vote. So you'll be seeing both packages and both um, breakdowns as soon as we can get that information to you. We have the presentation to you and we'll get you the breakdowns. I also want to um, have Arnie, after we go through this presentation, discuss with you the programming that we could expand in in a new facility. So thank you, and we'll start the presentation. You're okay. Uh, good evening. My name is John Dale. I'm a project architect with Breadloaf Corporation. Uh, we uh, uh, began working on this project last summer with Arnie and the staff, and uh, reviewing and surveying the building for uh, the conditions and the uh, deterioration and so forth of the building over 100 years. The lack of, as Cameron said, the lack of ADA compliance, but also there is a, a significant lack in terms of just general climate control systems, lighting, 
And the, one of the most notable things is that there's a whole 7,000 square foot basement that is inaccessible and thus not used except for storage basically right now, which fairly limits the building. So if we could um, proceed is that here are some pictures of the, um, the condition of the building. This is on Barry Street, just around the corner. You on the upper left, you see the front of the building that's right across the street from the senior center. Uh, the front of the building is a three-story uh, 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 building, and then it's backed by the ar old armory, the uh, main reception or uh, 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 gymnasium space, which was the assembly space for the armory when it, when it was originally built. And then there's a basement below that. As you can see in the second from the upper left picture, the windows on the, in the uh, main gymnasium space have all been blocked off. They may be under the plywood, nobody knows really, but essentially there's no daylight into the, the gymnasium space. In the third picture from the left, you can see the old uh, coal scuttles or uh, hatches for dr dumping the coal into the basement. There's a, a, a deteriorating uh, bulkhead there. And then the uh, upper right, uh, the front steps, the walls are separating from the steps. There, you know, there's a lot of movement in those walls. It, there's basically they're being undermined. There's large holes. You can see in the lower picture is some more de deterioration to the brick in the cornice and so forth. Uh, there's a fire escape that's rusting. Next, please. These are some interior pictures. The gymnasium space itself is really quite um, attractive. It's handsome. You walk as soon as you walk in the door, you get this great golden brick in this nice large room. It's used heavily every time I've been there. There's always been there's always been a basketball game or a pickleball match going on or a league going on. Uh, but as, again, there's no windows uh, there. The ceiling is d dingy. The lighting's terrible. The the baskets are you know 30, 40 years old. This is the, uh, the third picture from the left is the main office of the, uh, for the staff. And then the worst pictures here are in the up on the right side, the top and bottom. This is the, uh, just some examples of the mechanical room in the basement, which is full of asbestos pipe wrap piping, an old boiler that's been abandoned, a new boiler that's reaching the end of its service, serviceable life. And there's actually a whole room full of coal still there in the, in the, in the basement. Uh, you can't get in that room unless Arnie lets you in because it's it's a it's a disaster. Uh, and then you can see some of the other pictures of the uh, in the the different spaces. And then in the one in the second from the right on the bottom is the basement, and that's the typical space down there where it's just full of rec department uh, storage, and uh, which is great, but it's not you know for downtown location. It's there's better use for this. Next, please. So this is a floor plan, and it's a little confusing. I apologize. Um, it doesn't show up as well as we'd like. Is that um, it does in, in terms of this copy that it doesn't show up as well. The north is up. The right on the right side would be uh, Barry Street. So you have that rectangle with the X through it is the three-story section in the front with the entrance right in the middle. And this is the basement floor. And as you come down the stairs to the basement, you come into a small vestibule, and then. The mechanical room and the, boil, and the coal room and all that is in the bottom of the right set corner of the building. The upper right corner is a men's locker room, which is the only uh, locker room facility in there because it was built as an armory 100 years ago. And then you have a corridor running down the middle with columns on either side. All the walls down there are uh, CMU walls, block walls. And um, there's a shooting range presently along the bottom, uh, the lateral room at the bottom, long room at the bottom of the pa page is a shooting range. And then a series of smaller rooms, including an armory room up above, up above. In the rear of the building is a loading dock that is accessible, that has a garage door that's accessible from the street. This floor is about two or three feet below grade. Next, please. This is the first floor, which is about four feet, five feet above grade. Um, you come up the steps, which are just off to the right, into the front door, and then up a few more steps. So this is com totally non-ADA accessible. And then you wa go through the vestibule there and straight into the gymnasium. And in the back is a stage or, uh, you know, uh, raised stage area. There's some classrooms and a pool room and so forth that are used in the front and the, on the lower left. And then uh, the offices are in the upper right. And the next, please. This is the top floor. So the, um, you just have the, really the rooms on the right side of this plan, which is four rooms uh, around the vestibule area. So what we're proposing to do is to basically clean out all of the, this is the proposed basement floor, clean out all of the uh, 
uh, walls in the in the uh, basement, uh, except for the bearing walls and the perimeter of the two main spaces, and uh, run the keep and maintain the existing stair down because it it, it allows us to get a, a stair into a tight space which we wouldn't be able to do by code if we replaced it, and we'd like to. Uh, the stair is. Is there a Won't point? Really let you do yeah. that. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so we can. So, what we'll do is uh, fire rate the entire vestibule around the stair to basically enclose that stair in a fire rated vestibule. And just below that area where he was just pointing is this rectangle, which is where we're proposing to put. Oh, great. Thank you. Is just below that red dot is where we're proposing to put a new elevator. So we would add a door just to the right of the red door, dot from the outside next to the existing front steps where you would come in and that you would basically be between floors. So if you wanted to be, if you're in the, enter the elevator, you want to go down to the basement, you would go down about two feet and come off the opposite side of the elevator. So you'd enter from the right side, go down to two feet in the elevator and come out on the left side and then you would go up and into the vestibule and that would get you access to the basement floor. On this, going to the new program, what we have is on the upper right-hand uh, corner, we have, uh, to the right of that, please, camera, right there is we have lockers, men's lockers on the left, and the shower facilities and toilet facilities on the right. And the same thing down below, basically mirrored in below, is lock, women's locker rooms on the left, and their changing, uh, changing toilet room uh, shower facilities on the right. As you come out of the vestibule and go straight through, we have some. We have added a new thinner corridor with some glass walls at different locations to give you views into the spaces. On the right, what we're proposing is to have basically general exercise spaces. We divide it into two rooms, with a large with a pot where the divided have large um, sliding doors so they could be joined together or, or separated, and you could have. We'd have floors in there appropriate for dance class, for Zumba, for Tai Chi, and so forth, sort of semi-resilient floors. And then in the back, perhaps, you know, you could have uh, spin class and so forth. On the left side, what we're proposing to do is a more fitness exercise area. So in the front, to the right, you would have exercise, you know, treadmills, bikes, ergs, and so forth, uh, yoga balls, and et cetera, stretching out spaces. And then on the left is potentially uh, loose weights and weight machines and so forth. The corridor extends out to the back, it's the rear, up some steps, and goes out a new exit that we would create at the rear of the stage to get out to satisfy code. We're also proposing, by the way, is that this whole building would be sprinklered under this system, under this renovation. We'd maintain the loading dock on the left. And also what I'd like to add in is that we're proposing these is to replace, all, to remove all the plaster finishes in the building any stud walls that we want to maintain for, for uh, bearing capacity and so forth would be resheathed, the new gyp board. The walls down here, the perimeter walls down here would have stud walls built in front of them with insulation and then gyp board over them to gr improve the, uh, the, the envelope and the energy efficiency of the building. And the windows would all have, the existing windows, historic windows would all have um, storm windows installed on the inside. I'm sorry, did you say what chipboard was? Chipboard, uh, drywall, gypsum board. Just drywall. No, dry, well, drywall. Uh, this is the first floor, so you would come up the stairs as usual. We were proposing to rebuild the stairs as necessary to make them stable and, and good for the next 100 years. You come up the steps again, we would refinish all of the floor finishes in this, in this floor. The elevator again is to your right. You would come up the elevator and come out on the left side again into a little vestibule, and that would open into the Best, the main lobby, straight ahead off the lobby elevator is a family bathroom at this level, so it would have a shower, toilet, and bathroom in it, and that could be locked off, so you could go in there and use that separately. Um, it's also be a non-gender bathroom. Uh, and then to the bottom of the page, we're opening up that space into one large classroom. And then at the upper right, we're proposing that re to refurbish the stair to meet code, there would be an office in the upper right-hand corner that would have a view through glass doors to the, to the lobby. And then the upper left would be a conference slash classroom. Straight ahead, we're moving into the gymnasium. It would have fire doors that would be built, held open on, on magnetic hold opens. Um, and there's really, this is a great large opening going from the lobby into the gymnasium and is really attractive. 
we're proposing to install new windows in the in all of those large openings on the sides of the gym and have uh, painted aluminum screens on the inside to protect them from uh, balls and so forth for impact. The floor, we're, we're proposing to remove the floor and reinstall a new sprung uh, modern athletic competition type uh, basketball floor. And, and then uh, in the rear of the stage, we would basically close it off with a curtain so they could be used for storage and equipment that could then be pulled very easily into the room for use. Uh, next, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back, please. We're also proposing to replace the fire stair that's down here in the lower left-hand corner uh, to give the second means of egress from the space. Uh, and then on the upper floor, uh, we are not allowed to have assembly space on the upper floor by, by codes without adding another stair, which would basically take up most, much of the floor. So the elevator comes up, and you would get off on the right side this time and go into the vestibule. And then we have offices on the two offices on the upper side, a conference room down at the lower left-hand corner, and another office in the right lower right-hand corner. Uh, next, please. So this is the site plan of the building. You can see that dashed rectangle around the outside. That is essentially the lot lines. The building actually takes up most of the lot. It takes up more of the lot than it appears in, when you're there in person. So there really isn't a lot of, there isn't any opportunity for increasing the parking, unfortunately, on the lot. So essentially we're basically just regularizing the existing parking that's there. So you have three spots along the driveway to the bottom and then six spots, six or seven spots along the back property line. What we're proposing is to, to repave the existing paving. Uh, as I said, rebuild the front steps, add a ramp, slight ramp going down into the new doorway next to the front steps. There will be uh, a new hatch put in the roof, but we, as a baseline, we're talking about keeping the existing roof materials on the roofs. They're, rel they're both we were installed in the last 10 years at different times. The front roof and the back roof were installed at different times. Uh, and we'd have rooftop mechanical equipment mounted on the roofs. Uh, next, please. This is a section through the building. It's a little complicated, to, a little difficult to read, but you can sort of see how the elevator would allow you to get to all these different levels and so forth. The, on the one note is on the gymnasium, we're proposing to replace the ceiling of the gymnasium with a new gypsum board ceiling uh, and put in acoustical panels on, underneath the ceiling. The floor level that's between the gymnasium and the lower level, if you're in there when there's a, if you're in the basement when there's a basketball game going on right now, it's quite noisy. What we're proposing is to fill the joist space, the wooden joist space with bat insulation, put hang gyp board, a gypsum board ceiling on resilient channels below that, and then put tectum panels again, acoustical panels again on that ceiling to maintain as much of the uh, ceiling height as possible. If we remove, um, as one of the options is to remove all of the slabs in the basement, we might be a chance to actually lower them by 6, 12 inches. We'd have to see what the conditions are and increase the height in the basement for, for exercise. Right now it's about 8 feet, 7 and a half to 8 feet when we're all done. Next, please. These are just views of the exterior. You can see the, this, the upper image is the north elevation. You can see the new window, nice large new windows in the gymnasium and the historic windows in the front being re, uh, restored and um, uh, upgraded in terms of insulation values. Same on the south side. You can see the new, st the new fire stair with a roof over it as required by code. Um, and then the, uh, the front steps would note as would be repaired and probably rebuilt as necessary. Next, please. Uh, as the front elevation, and you can see just to the left of the front door is the, uh, the new entrance we were proposing. We would restore, refurbish the, the nice front doors to the main entrance. And one of the upgrades we're talking about is putting a canopy of some, maybe a glass and metal canopy over the front door and extending it over the side. It's a design issue we'd have to really, that need, really need to be studied. But that's one upgrade that we put in some money for in terms of the, the, the higher end price. Sorry, can you say that last part again? What is, what is it that? Well, one of, it's not shown here, but one of the things we're proposing is that it might be nice to see if we could come up with a historically not necessarily start, but it's sensitive and attractive canopy over the front door oh. to for so when you enter, particularly with the handicap entrance, is pretty exposed when you go in. 
And these are just some uh, computer views of the basement uh, workout spaces and what they'd be like and so forth. Uh, the, on the left is the fitness room, and on the right is looking into this, what we're sh proposing is might be a spin room. You can see some of the glass walls into the corridors and so, and so forth. So the base estimate, which is essentially what we're talking about is gutting the inside of the building, uh, putting all new electrical, new electric service into the building, new mechanical systems, uh, refinishing all the finishes except in the gymnasium where we like, we're proposing to keep the, the nice golden brick exposed, uh, putting in, upgrading the, seal, the roof insulation where there isn't any roof insulation, which is in, on the portion of the building, uh, new floor finishes throughout the building, uh, about 50% of the slabs, the concrete slabs in the basement being uh, de demolished and replaced because they're cracking or they're at the wrong, in the wrong, wrong height. Uh, and then all new, uh, yeah, refurbishing the stair, new finishes, new, uh, new uh, athletic floor systems in the basement and in the, the gymnasium, uh, new finishes such as carpet tile and uh, linoleum in the, in the classrooms and hallways up in the upper floors. Uh, this uh, and then, of course, all new locker rooms, new the, all the new plumbing services for the locker rooms and the uh, change in the toilet rooms. Uh, some new uh, reconnecting the utilities to the street, replacing the oil heat with uh, hooking the building up to the city gas, and so um, and uh, repaving the exterior. That's uh, the paving around the outside. That's in a nutshell is essentially the uh, the scope of the work there. The cost of this, in terms of construction cost, is approximately uh, $2,750,000, and then with a, we've assigned a construction management fee at this point of 4%, and then also a construction contingency of 10%. That gets you to a total estimated fee, uh, construction cost of $3,154,000. Uh, next, please. The, some of the signing also, we listed some of the costs that what you could expect that would be owner's cost us above the construction. So a design services estimated fee of 8% on the construction would be $250,000. Financing would be something that would be determined uh, we would uh, by you in terms of the cost and legal aspect. Uh, having a, we estimated the cost to have uh, hazardous inspection testing done of $5,000 and we made a total guess at what it would cost to do the hazardous material abatement of $95,000. That may be high, it may be low, we really don't know what that would be. Um, again, uh, payment performance bond of $25,000. We are assuming uh, that permits, you would not be uh, charging permits for this building as it's a city project. And then some ba basically miscellaneous fees below that. And then we also added an owner's contingency of 10%. That adds $500,000 to the uh, uh, to the cost of the project, total cost of the project, and you would have an overall, when you add these all together, of total project budget estimated at $3,900,000. Uh, then if we wanted to upgrade, we added some costs here for upgrade. For so, for instance, in the, ba in the shower rooms and bathrooms downstairs, what we proposed is a burnished or polished concrete floors and then just chipboard on the in vinyl base on the sides or tile base on the si on the on the walls. If we upgraded that to have tile on the walls, in the bathroom showers, not in the locker room, that would be adding thirteen thousand uh, dollars. To remove and replace the entire basement slab would add seventy thousand uh, dollars. Put the canopy or the porch roof over the front doors um, be estimated at thirty thousand dollars. A climbing wall, which Arnie has already told me he doesn't want, uh, <laughs> fifty-seven thousand dollars for you know a, um, the climbing wall, and also the uh, reinforcing the structure to accept it. Uh, fitness and weight room equipment, we just took a shot at sixty-three thousand dollars, and then upgrades to the to make the HVAC system, the heating and air conditioning system, um, uh, more energy efficient would be $177,000. There probably would not be a return on investment in a short period of time on that. Uh, and upgrading ability and lighting of $106,000. Installing a generator and the uh, infrastructure necessary for the generator would be $69,000. And by the time we added all of the equipment and new hatch and so forth to so the east roof, 
uh, the higher roof on the east uh, the street side, we thought, you know, maybe we need to replace the roof, and that would be $12,000. So that ends up being, when you add all those things, those multiple that increases the multipliers on the owner's cost, which would be the next page. Um, when all that's said and done, that would be a $4,700,000 project, total project budget. So it goes up about $800,000 when you've added all those upgrades to the project. That ends that part of the presentation. Did you have any direct questions for John before we turn it over to Arnie? Um, I have lots of questions, but I can save them to the end, I suppose. Do you have a presentation, or like, should I leave? Or no, I actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Go ahead. Um, no, Cameron. I didn't realize I was talking about this tonight, but I was actually per prepared for it. Thank you, Arnie. So, um, <clears throat> some of the things that we can do with with once the building becomes accessible, and we can get people of all abilities into the building, we can go back to doing special events into the building. We used to do our Halloween party there, but we moved it to the high school as a result because of access issues. Um, other special events is just we threw one out was like a town a town wide garage sale, but I'm just throwing that out as something in addition. Um, after school child care would become a possibility. Specialized classes, um, the uh, ability to have uh, classes right after school. Um, right now we, we don't have that uh, ability. Um, we can do group exercise classes, and John already threw out the spinning classes. Um, the ability to host more. Of our of our own programs, a lot of right now we have to rely on other space in the school building. Sometimes, you know, events come up and all of a sudden our programs get bumped, and you know we try to work that out the best we can. Vacation camps, um, evening programming, we can extend our hours, especially if we have a fitness in the fitness um, component in the basement. Um, Additional rental opportunities for the building. Right now, pretty much all we rent in that building is the gym, and we do pretty well with that. But if we can rent other space in that building, I think we'll we'll see an increase there. And the other thing is additional summer rental opportunities because we have less rentals in the summertime, but with the new space and people really <clears throat> seeing what it could be, I think we'll rent it out a lot more. So I see a lot of potential with the uh, with the with the space and what we can do with it right now we have on the, the last time I assessed it we had quite a you know over 9,000 between 9 and like 15,000 people that come through the building over the course of a year through basically gym um, gym use gym rentals but I think if we open up that whole basement which is another 7,000 square feet um, we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna see that space grow as far as use so I have a lot of, lot of good ideas that going forward on how we can expand things and, um, and having the ability to do after school stuff will be huge. So. Cool. Um, questions? Go ahead, Ashley. I have a bunch yeah, of yeah go for it. Yeah. Um, so this might be more toward Bill, but I'm going to ask it generally. So um, I saw the different price tag choices. Um, and d has, um, has, has, have your, you, your office, and anybody? We just got these numbers today. today. Okay. So, um, is it, is it possible to get, um, just like the math done out for the next time that we Absolutely. take this up in terms of the, the bonding, you know, potential that we have that was allocated and sort of what, what additional bonding this might entail, depending on how we do it, and sort of where that would put us in terms of, you know, are we going to be like up to here, you know, if we bond everything, and we're really going to be, right. you know, I, I would just like to get a sense um, for that. And I love to hear that you're thinking about after school stuff. It's so critical. And I used to live right next door to there, and that was one of my favorite parts. Was like, here's a place where I know young people are going. I know that they are engaged in safe and healthy ways, you know, and hopefully that meant that I wouldn't see them later in life in my day job. But 
Um, I would really encourage one thing that I've received a lot of feedback about um, from constituents is uh, the classes that are offered at the senior center. There's a yoga class and a few other movement-based classes. Um, and then some people express some frustration just about like the limited offerings. And I'm super excited that this is right across the street and can sort of be open to everyone. So I'm really glad to hear the right after school stuff and opening it up maybe during the day to like younger kids or I love it. I'm excited. Jack. Great job. This is uh, ha having had a tour of the whole building and uh, it's, it's great to see you know, what could be. A couple of uh, thoughts are, one is, <coughs> it's been a year or so since I had that tour, but it, it seems as though we have a lot of stuff stored in the building. And just looking at the diagrams, it wasn't clear to me whether you're building in enough storage for everything we need. Probably there's a lot of stuff there that's stored because nothing else is being done with the space, so why not keep it around, but uh, but that's one consideration. I would say that would be correct. Uh, sure. Is there stuff we that we have? I mean, the, the basement basically hasn't been a, a, an area that we've really been able to utilize. And the one thing we don't like to do is throw stuff out if we can possibly use it in the future. Um, but as this grows and this opportunity grows with the space, um, we're going to be thinning a lot of that stuff out. Some of it, too, is um, a lot of baseball stuff, which is also now um, has taken on a, a tour of its own. So Little League has become more independent from us. Mm -hmm. And so I'll see if I can also get them to store the stuff mm -hmm. for the league versus us storing it for them. The, so the, uh, great. The other thing I thought about was do the, do the cost, I don't know if you're to that level of detail yet, but do the cost estimates include any potential uh, subsidies or uh, participation from uh, from Efficiency Vermont for the uh, for the lighting and HVAC? The, um, the there there you should be uh, eligible for several different potential rebates. I'll say this that they're not probably going to be huge change or you know game changers in terms of the uh, uh, hate that term but huge change you know. You know, order of magnitude changes in in terms of what affects the budget. Okay. So, but it's you know there is obviously there's when I said it, the mechanical systems might not have the return on investment, but the lighting certainly any lighting improvements we can make will have a definite return on investment in terms of energy. The, and the mechanical systems will too. I mean, it's just it's it's all just being prudent. Right, changing to LED lighting change saves the base would have LED lighting lot, yeah. in it. Um, it's uh, it's more getting into, you know, more controls and, you know, occupancy sensors, daylight sensors, things like that, other other aspects that we can do to improve the efficiency of the lighting. So Great, thanks. Can we each get a piece of that coal in the basement? <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally serious. You know, I did get coal one Christmas. No I'm not about that again, but. <laughs> I'm sure that can be worked out. Uh, Lauren. I'll pull up my pink spray paint for that. <laughs> so uh, this is really exciting. I think I, it's great to see all the opportunity. I have kids who use it for basketball, and that's about all we've used it. Um, and some birthday parties now and then, so it's great to think of all the different ways that the building could be used. So really excited. And camps and other things. There's such a lack right now in the community. So um, after school care and all that seems really great. Um, I don't know if tied kind of into that, I was curious, like, is there creating certain spaces? Have you thought about, like, what that would mean for staffing? Or is it something, like, is that just so far down the road? Or is it like, OK, if we're going to build this kind of space, it would involve this kind of programs, and therefore this kind of commitment of the city to really make use of it? Or is it is it not that? Well, I, I, I actually have thought a little bit about that, because usually like six nights a week right now, we have open gym from mm -hmm. seven to nine and then Friday and Saturday it goes till 10. So during that time, I already have staff that are committed to working. So if we have programs going on downstairs, I have, I have somebody in the, in the building. Mm -hmm. So it, we don't have to hire additional staff in that situation. So, and a lot of our, a lot of our um, instructors are also subcontractors. So it wouldn't be staff that would be added to our current budget, but they would be, um, paid through the program. Yeah, that's 
Great. Um, my only other question, well, one thought that went through my head when you said it was a shooting range. I don't know for the hazard <laughs> abatement, if, like if there's lead issues with all the. That, that's to, to you know that's one of the reasons we. S lead. <laughs> <laughs> You're real fun time. There, there's um there's quite a there's you know there. Aside from the asbestos in the mechanical room and so forth, there may be some asbestos, we're not sure, in some of the plaster air, you know, materials and tape and d different things like that that shows up. There obviously is this wall that Arnie points out to everybody about that there's a million bullets back there and so forth. So we don't, we, that will be part of the abatement issue. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of lead paint and other uh, things that are more difficult to get rid of, they're really would be essentially covered by all of the new finishes. So it's either being removed with the old plaster that's taken out or it's being covered. And the nice thing about the gymnasium with this wonderful brick is it doesn't have any apparent coating on it. That any, so it's, it should be safe. Right. So um, one last question. Yeah, yeah. Um, just the last thing. So you talked some about the efficiency and um, you know with our city's net zero goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you look at all, like, could we put solar on the building instead of getting a fossil fuel generator? Could we get solar and power walls? Could we, I mean, are we putting our money where our mouth is and create, designing this to actually be, um, it seems like a probably hard big space to heat and things, but. The, I think you've hit, nailed the one thing, which is the, the heating and ventilating large spaces because you have to ventilate them so much is, is problematic in terms of it, doing it in a really in a electrically efficient manner or fuel, fossil fuel efficient in it. But I do think is that as we go more into the project or if the project goes forward, and we're, is that really studying what kind of systems could we use? Could we use heat pumps to deal with most of the spaces and so in, in, in getting into that aspect of it? Um, is, is it even feasible at all? You know, do we really want to not insulate the gymnasium? Could we, would it be worth it to, you know, to cover the brick up and, and beef up those walls in terms of their insulation? Um, you know, that's stuff that we can certainly look into, so. This is a small one. This is awesome, by the way. Um, you know, I think when we originally spoke about this, it was almost like we were settling for this, but I'm really excited with some of the stuff you're coming up with. It's great. Uh, again, minor. I really like the basketball court. <laughs> when you talk about, like, a modern floor and everything, I think people generally like the basketball court. Um, what does that mean? I will say that I, on my tours, when I've been underneath it, it is so loud, so loud, it would be completely unfeasible to have a yoga class down there in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. So. But, but I also thought the floor was going flat. Wasn't there something about that, Arnie, that the floor itself, when it came to balls, something about its tension? Dead spots. Um, from basketball players, talked about the floor and the condition. Like dead spots? Sometimes yeah. there would be, be dead like spots, a dead, thank you. dead spot. No, that's more typical over a, a hardwood floor that's put over cement because the glue comes on it where these are nailed about down. This but one. Occasionally, all. they might find a soft spot, but it's it's an old floor. <laughs> we, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, we actually um, spoke with the... Uh, the subcontractor that does most of the wood uh, basketball floors in the in the state and we went through three different options and essentially came out to the same price point which is surprising what, you know, the first option which was to take up the the existing top floor the finished basketball floor which is bit, is pretty close to the end of its life and there's gaps in it around the sides which have been filled in with plywood and so forth so it's got a patina to it but it's probably reached the end of its life but is that to, to replace just that top layer um, would involve probably going back in and re-tightening and screwing down uh, the subfloor and probably adding another layer to that to get it to be perfectly leveled before you put down just a finished wood floor on top of that. The, third, the second thing we looked at was, okay, take off the dead existing basketball floor, put down a new layer of plywood and do all that screwing and everything, and put down a synthetic floor on top of that. And the third one was, take up that floor and put down on top of it the sprung wood floor, which is, if you know what that means, is that it's put into tracks and it's got rubber and it can go up and down a little bit. And they all ended up, he thought that they basically priced out the same in the end between labor and materials and so forth. And so that's still something that could be explored what the solution is. So and they could be parquet? 
<laughs> but, but you described it as a professional flooring, did you not? Competition floor, like a Competition sprung, flooring. sprung floor would basically. Okay, but it's the same cost. It, the, it, it would surprise me because I thought, oh, the yeah. baseline is going to be just replacing the wood. Yeah. And it, what he said, it, to really do it right is it's going to end up being the same. one of the, okay. you know, they're all in the same wet range. Uh, I just wanted to chime in on Lauren's points about trying to make it energy efficient as possible. Um, I really like the idea of uh, using the resources that we have and making them uh, as as good as we can. Uh, I'm also uh, being advised by someone who I won't name at the moment uh, who says that it would be <laughs> um, better for example, to tear that building down and build a new one that we can insulate and, and do uh, well enough to, to meet some of our uh, more ambitious energy goals. So I suppose it's not a question, but, but just kind of a, a, a point of reference in terms of <coughs> what the possibilities are. When we're talking about beautiful golden brick walls, um, and a brick wall outside, like, is there any space between those walls uh, in the main large space? <coughs> is it, it, it's not possible to insulate the, the, the gym part and maintain the, the inner golden brick that you're... No, it probably, we haven't taken a core of the wall, but it's probably a 12-inch solid brick wall so that there's an interior face that's this one, and there's an exterior face that's red brick interior face golden brick and there's probably a sort of a basic brick in the middle but it's essentially a 12 inch thick brick wall if we went into it thinking that we'll be building a wall inside of the wall and then we just every time we kept going back and seeing this we were like maybe this is you know worth it so I think that's a that is an issue to be explored let me say also on the other hand is that two things about building new is that one is you do lose the embodied energy of this building and the in the historic history of the building of to be redundant, but the you know, yeah. the the fabric, the historic fabric of the of the old neighborhood. The the second thing is that if you went in and built this new with the present codes and so forth, we probably there's going to be a few things that we're going to have to do differently. Like the stair is going to have to be treated differently. We actually get an exempt to a certain extent. The code allows you an exemption for reusing the stair in terms of the dimensions. If we built in, it works perfectly fine. We have to upgrade the railings and different things like that. But it, it would be difficult to f fit a uh, code compliant modern stair into that space and um, that had, obviously that has to do with the configuration of the building as it is now presently it is now but the the site is so small that it really it's almost filling the entire <laughs> site and it surprised me when I saw where the lot lines were it's just not it's just a tiny it's not a very big it's basically a residential lot sort of piggybacking on um, the questions about energy efficiency, I is this something that would be on district heat? Could so the district heat lines don't go out that way. Um, so if my correct in saying city gas, which surprised yeah, me. Yeah, I was going to say, we don't have city gas. Oh, there isn't? Okay. Well, then it, no I'm gas. sorry. I apologize. That's okay. Yeah. I was like, we have something that I don't our, know. Our me mechanical electrical plumbing uh, uh, director know, knows this, but I'm yeah. sorry. should have brought him tonight. <laughs> but um, uh, is then we'd be putting in a tank someplace in the, in the, so on the property. Oh, could we expand? I guess I'm only asking about district heat because a few people have asked me, like, what this whole project was because there's not really been – sort of much in the paper about it, and so... Um, about District Heat? When it happened. On, on, well, when, when, it, when, when, it, when it happened, yeah, but yeah, people okay. have been asking now, like, what the city is doing, and so I would really encourage, if, if we could get numbers for what it might look like to bring that to the rec center, you know, if this is going to be, if this is going to be the plan, I, and we have a facilities director starting you know it seems like this might really be the time to start the conversation again about like hey can we get this on district heat and then you know where can we go from there because the senior center is across the street and it just seems like this that you know there would be a cost to it for sure but if if this is something that we're committed to doing it might be worth it to expend some additional funds to get the lines to go out there so that we can then explore what other 
partnerships or opportunities might exist. Jack. Isn't, isn't there a dispute about uh, the available capacity of, uh, of that plant? Yeah. So that's something that would obviously have to be resolved. The, there's that, and I'll, I mean, I think that's probably resolvable, but also the, the cost of extending lines is very significant, at least to there. But we'd, we, you know, we could price it out. I mean, I think we can just do a rough linear cost per linear foot. I don't think we need to get an engineer, but um, I, think it would, I think we might be surprised what that means versus the revenue it would generate, but we can see. I think if we, if we were going to do that, we would have to probably, to make it worth while we'd, we'd want to explore like adding people along the Absolutely, way right. but <coughs> i mean who knows if that load would even be make it viable yeah. so but it's a good question it just it <coughs> seems like that might be an opportunity we have someone new starting who could start looking at that and start cultivating those relationships now so that as we plan this to see if we can get you know any other potential clients customers interested it might it might end up that it is worth it to to do that so i just want to make sure we keep that on uh, one thing about the pv panels that was raised um already just whispered to me um is that the, there is a nice flat roof it's or, oriented east-west, so it'd be a great, you know, southern orientation and so forth. We do have some allowances within these estimates for uh, structural upgrades to make sure, you know, we'd have to review this, the roof structure to make sure that it could handle the additional load, which is not huge for PV panels. Um, so I have a whole bunch of questions, but I, I guess I would say um, if we're going to spend almost $4 million on a building, uh, then I would rather spend five million to uh, make it significantly uh, energy efficient and fossil fuel free. Actually, um, so I mean I have some questions about um, the. Pl I mean, it, it, so if the plan was to um, have city gas, which we don't have, um, uh, but a tank, um, then that you know that to me says you know it's probably some kind of fossil fuels. We had. Um, with the Energy Committee, we just sort of bat around the idea of using um, locally sourced biodiesel, mm -hmm. um, which apparently you can burn biodiesel as uh, as regular diesel with a couple of tweaks to um, the the furnace, like the some of the nozzles need to be of a, a wider gauge, um, that sort of thing. So that I, I wouldn't mind trying to pilot that um, if that is still. Um, feasible. So that's option one. Another option, I, you mentioned heat pumps. I'm very interested in the, f the possibility of that. Um, again, it's a large space, tall ceilings. That's tough. Um, I, my understanding is that with um, tall spaces like that, uh, sometimes radiant floor heating is a good option, but if we're also um, putting it uh, under some kind of, uh, you know, s of spring, uh, that it's like a, this professional floor. I don't know how that jives with uh, radiant floor best heating. Best floor in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Probably um, should just lay down for a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I don't know um, how possible that is, but it is a high priority for me that we heat this building to the extent possible without fossil fuels. And that includes putting solar on the roof. Um, and I would actually add, I'd, I'd go one step further and say that I would uh, love to uh, see what it costs. I, and I, I imagine it's on the scale of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but if we turn this if building into its own microgrid um, in terms of having enough batteries um, to supply um, for you know an appropriate length of time, um, I think we need more microgrids. Are you familiar with the term microgrid? Um, so, uh, generally speaking, it is uh, you, you could uh, an easy way to think of it is that uh, if there's a blackout, uh, there's some kind of a fault switch that flips that um, there's enough uh, generation and storage to keep the lights on in that facility. And one of the reasons is not, I mean, there's some obvious benefits there in terms of, um, you know, emergency preparedness. Um, I think it would be good to have a place where a lot of people could go in the city, should we need to. I mean, there's a question about whether that's the, r the right place because it's sort of near the river. <coughs> um, but uh, barring that, um, there, are other, there are some other um, just good reasons to have um, additional storage uh, in um, municipal buildings, just in, in terms of um, 
lowering peak demand and uh, so making it cheaper for the city, et cetera, this feels like an opportunity um, to really do some, some good digging on that, especially if we were already you know, millions of dollars in. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to put that out there as a priority for me. I had some questions about the layout. I couldn't find um, the existing boiler room um, or mechanical room on the drawings in the basement. Sure. I'll pull it up and while I'm doing that, I will say that um, I will sort of live or die by the idea of um, having a generator in both, both the base plan and the um, upgraded plan because I think you're right. I think this is very important to have for our emergency preparedness. Right now, there isn't um, a building that we have that has a generator that has a big enough space to host a Red Cross shelter. If there is a flooding event or if there is an event where a large amount of folks lose power, then we don't have a place to put them. We don't have a place to host them. We could find one, no doubt. We will. Everyone always does. But it would be nice to already have a prepared space that we know would be safe for folks to go. And to add on to that, I would love to not necessarily be dependent on national life in that sense. I mean, because that's sort of like the obvious place to go um, because it is up on a hill, um, but we're that, but that's not under our jurisdiction. So, so the existing um, uh, boiler room is in the lower right hand corner. Right here? Yeah. So. No, I got you. Okay, thanks. Um, so the boilers are actually in this. Wow, this is tricky. <laughs> <laughs> the boilers are actually in this space here, the abandoned boiler and the, and the more recent boiler, which is about 30 some years old. I guess you just couldn't be sure. Yeah, probably 30, 20 years old. Yeah. This is the room, this little room is the room with the coal in it. And then this back here is the room that nobody wants to walk into when it gets <laughs> And so <laughs> you can see those little slots down in the lower right. Those are the hatches where they would dump the coal in. So uh, that space would be a women's locker room and shower space and bathroom. So is there a new planned mechanical room? Yes. Where is that? So it's tiny. Um, okay. It would be in this space in here. Oh, yeah, okay. So um, it's 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 really not it's not for the most part it's going to be sprinkler okay. entrance um, hot water heater and things like that and then a re electrical entrance. Um, if if we did, I mean, not not saying that we would go down the route of a microgrid, but if we did and we needed battery storage, my guess is that that wouldn't fit in that space. No, I think you know I'm thinking about this is if you're going to have all these power walls and stuff, you're going to put yeah, them, yeah. put them over in here. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so. Oh, I just want to make a note. Um, the lighting on the outside of the building that abuts the bike path pr at present is pretty poor. Mm -hmm. So and I, I think it'd be a not hard thing to ask um, to just have great lighting mm -hmm. um, right uh, on, uh, what is that, the east side of the building? Well, west, yes. west um, side. It's not just the bike path path that exists now, but along the side where it's going to connect with Barry Street. Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. both, really. Both, both sides. Yeah. I, both sides. Yeah. I, I just, I used to live right there, yeah, yeah. and there, like, once a week we would call in, like, dirty needles, so yeah, yeah. the better Sketchy. lighting that we can have there, just, it's right on the train tracks. Yep. So this is the west side, so you're basically talking about the back of the parking lot there on the left. And, and, yeah. the left. and then along, yeah, we could build, do building mounted lighting, um, that would be fairly low, so it's not going to disturb the neighbors. So that really, when you're li when you do this clockwise loop around the building now, yep. you're actually exiting across the neighbor's property. Yep. On the top, and so people, oh. yeah, <laughs> people drive in from the lower side, go clockwise around the building, and uh, you're exiting out. To, and I guess the neighbors do the same thing, right? So, yeah. that, so well, to get to their back here, back of the house, they go around the rec center. Okay, um, I want to be really specific about um, one of the spaces. Um, I'm really grateful, Arnie, for the list of ideas of things that could happen. Um, at present, the upper classrooms are, eh, I don't know, underused, I guess. Um, but they're effectively the classrooms now, and that we would refurbish them to be classrooms after. Um, what is the vision for the use of that space, if anything? 
for the upper classrooms. Yes. Well, one of our ideas too was to not only use it as a meeting space, people could use um, that area as a meeting space. We could rent it out for meetings. I know the senior center right now does meeting space rentals. Um, we could also use that as a yoga room upstairs so they wouldn't be under the gym and other quiet activities that might want to be utilized up there as well as after school art programs. We could use that for right now. Okay. And I know that once the building is ADA compliant, it will be easier to get our folks from the senior center across the street into those classrooms. They, they don't have as much space as they would want ever. And so there is opportunity there to share between those two spaces. Great, so it's the reason it's underutilized now is because there's no elevator, basically. I would argue oh, that. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fair. Okay. One and, of the yeah. things that Arnie, we, one of the, Arnie says we set this room up as an after school room. And that, so you, kids could be here and they could have direct access out to the, this door doesn't exist now, it's an added doorway um, out to the gymnasium so the kids could go back and forth between yeah. those areas. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you still have the stage over here. Um, is it ever used as a stage still? It's not used as a stage, but the elevation of the stage, this is constantly asked, why don't we just plow it down and make it the same level, is then that would make that loading dock below in, unusable. Okay. It, so to reduce the ceiling, the ceiling height down to five feet or something like that. Would be so okay. And right now the stage is used, sorry, Arnie. No, that's okay. It for storage, and I think that answers some of Jack's questions about storage, is that's our, our main storage space, and I think a lot, they did build in some little storage cages into the downstairs areas, but I do believe that once we consolidate the stuff, hopefully it would fit in that stage area. There's foosball and air hockey that the kids really like on a stage right now. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> and pickleball. Foosball oh. and, air and air hockey and some other really fun games that the kids like up on the stage right Is that now. being used, the foosball that. or air hockey? Oh, yeah. I mean, like siblings while the other kids yeah, playing yeah. basketball okay. or something. Okay. Or for birthday parties, but it could certainly sure be better used. <laughs> we could, <laughs> this, this um, awesome. I had <laughs> some, I, I was really glad to see in the um, sort of computer modeling of what the interior of the basement would look like with workout equipment. It looked like there were windows sort of at a reasonable height. I mean, one of the concerns, of course, in putting anything in a basement is having enough light. And I mean, I assume these are windows. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so there'd be a decent, it, it seems like there would be a, mm, so yeah, a how, much <laughs> how much light are we talking about here? <laughs> so I think you, um, the um, interesting thing is that the, uh, uh, I'm not sure why it was done like this, but there aren't that many windows on the north side, which is the upper, I mean, there's, there's windows on the upper side, the north side, excuse me, at every bay. You can see there's a, there's a good five foot wide by four foot high window that's fairly high. That's the upper, up to the upper wall. Yep, yep, but down but the here. the lower wall hardly has any windows So that's the only two windows? Yep. Okay. So that was one of the reasons why we put the exercise equipment down here. I don't know if that's it was the right choice. I don't know, but you know. Well, I, I think the, the other reason too. I think they didn't put windows in there is that's where the fire and rain was. Oh, of course. And there's, <laughs> there's not there's not an opportunity to put windows in, or like there was uh, were there windows that were boarded up or no, no they were never. Put there were never windows in. Right. No, there's okay. one of those things is probably. But um, that could become a window. I think it's big you, enough. You, you could make windows. It's a, it's, it, it, it's, Shake yeah. The foundation. Yeah. It's, it's, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's just, you could. It's just, it's, yeah. I, I don't think it'd be historically that big. Yeah, no, okay. Fair enough. Um, and actually, it does get quite a bit of light with the windows we do have down there. Yeah. So if there is um, some glass ways through that hallway, I think the light will come across okay. to some um, and I assume these are, this is closet space. That's right. Here, as same as the other side. Okay. Um, uh, I just want to observe that the mural on the back of the building is just a little faded. And I just want to note that um, we could maybe either get the art commission or someone to like touch it up, you know, after we're done with all this good work, and or just commission a new mural. And either time. it might be time. Sometimes, you know, art has a lifetime, and that's, that's okay. But uh, anyway, I just want to make a note of that. Um, 
Thank you for raising the question about the FTEs associated with managing this space. Um, I'd love to, s I mean, one possibility, as you said, is that it's the same as what we have now. Um, I mean, I worry about somebody trying to monitor things going on on two different floors um, at the same time. But I'll just put that out there. Um, how I'm sure this is information that was shared when we went on the tour, but I don't remember, unfortunately. Um, w is the shooting range currently, like how much is the, cur sh the shooting range currently used or not it's at all? all? It's been, it's been closed. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, I think. No, it's been, no. it's actually been since we come under the city in July of 2017, the insurance company for the city looked to see the number of that to be used. Well, two years, that's pretty recent to me. Two years, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <not laughs> no, it's pretty recent. Recent. It seems like a long time. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think that, are, are that is all of the questions I have at this point. Just want to reiterate um, high priority on, on the no fossil fuels. We just built the Taylor Street build. We didn't. <laughs> well, we did. Yes, we yes, did. We did. Uh, we'll, the, we didn't design. The nest. Anyway, it's important, not important. The point is Taylor Street building does not is not being heated with fossil fuels, and I would like to keep that as a precedent for us, if we can. We can get you some estimates. Okay, and I recognize that will probably be more expensive. So okay. Can Friendly. I ask, John, can I ask you publicly, how long do you think that will take you, just so that we know right. maybe we don't wanna, maybe we want more than one week, or just? Let me, can I re get back to you too? Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. Great, this is all very much, like this is a big decision, and so right. if it takes, a couple of meetings. I've already um, asked for this to be on the agenda again um, at the next meeting, but n the next meeting might be too soon. Um, yeah, okay, well, we'll see, yeah. Uh, Mayor's questions about the mechanical room brought up a possibly stupid question in my mind, but I'm taking this as a, a opportunity to educate myself. So uh, a couple of slides on, there's the elevation, I think, um, and uh, it, I noticed the um, the elevator shaft, and I think someone explained to me recently that elevators have to extend either below uh, where they're functionally usable or above. Like either you put the, the mechanicals up on the roof or down underneath the, the rest of it. So this is this would have a, a, a hydraulic uh, pump and. Uh, machinery in a room next to it in the basement. So okay. there's a, a room next to where we showed the mechanical room, which we, it's titled EMR, um, okay. the ele elevated machine room. The reason why this says 12 foot 11 above it on the right side up there is that's the clearance that the elevator will require to uh, at the top. I see. So it, even though the cab is seven foot six inches tall or whatever, it needs more space above it to the shaft has to be extended above the floor by 12 feet, 11 inches, okay. and it just makes it just okay. nice without going through the roof. Yeah, and I guess the, the other part of my, my question is um, to do with uh, flooding and so on. Does it, uh, is it a smart idea to consider putting things like mechanicals and so on up at the top if you can in this space, or is that not necessary here? Um, <laughs> well, we're, the, the, when we were talking about these, it's sort of baseline mechanical systems, they would have been on the roof. Um, when we're going back to, um, if we're using heat pumps and so forth, they'll probably be, they could be mounted on the roof, but they may be, you know, on the outside someplace. Uh, I'm not too, I'm not, we're not too, I'm not too concerned with that stuff being in the basement, really. Um, I wouldn't be, you know, with the electrical entrance, the sewer, the sprinkler entrance, that all has to come in through the basement. So that there has to be a mechanical room of some type that's for just those, you know, those types of systems. I, I want to echo that question, but in the context of if we, if it's a microgrid and there are batteries, do you put them in the basement? I don't know. I, I you know, we can putting the finding space for the, the wall panels in, in the, you know, on the stage someplace. So I think we, we can find it. Okay. We can find it. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to. Um, I also want to put in a plug for finding a day in the summer for a uh, citywide garage sale. Yes. <laughs> yes. We've talked about doing that. And you, you're on board. 
<laughs> no? Yes? Yes? Yes. Yeah? yes? I don't know how you set prices. I also feel like if we're going to have a city regular garage sale, we probably should specify, like, this is going towards blank, and I don't know what that is yet. Um, but can we can we pick a day in the summer and, like, plan for it now? Sure. Okay. Who knows where are we, we at the Can time? we fund a social worker with the money that we raise or work towards it? <laughs> well, mm, my only hesitation with that is that this is one-time money. Yeah. Right, so it should be, like, a. I would recommend it be a one-time thing, as opposed to, like, if you want a social worker, that should be an ongoing. But if we get the money now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we can we can have that conversation, but what would it go towards? I don't know. I mean, July third is the funnest day of the year. It's true. I mean, to be fair, it could fu help fund. I mean, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna be not that much money. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, as why garage sales always are. Why are we are, naysaying right? a great idea? <laughs> it is a great idea. It's just I think we we're not gonna raise a million dollars with it. We might raise. Couple well, thousand. Oh, really? <laughs> and I suppose it, it would be a question of like, whose time, whose time is it? When is the to one at that? the senior Sounds center? Like the mayor's. I, I mean, I would. The mayor's citywide garage sale. What I else do I do in the summer? If we I don't coordinated with the senior <laughs> center, <laughs> I would gladly help. Yes. Are we talking about? Are we all talking about the same thing here? Because when you talk about. This isn't like an opportunity for homeowners or residents to bring stuff to sell stuff. This is for the city to sell all all the surplus stuff we have lying around in the public right. works garage and all over right. the place. Yeah. I guess the proper word would not be citywide. Right? It's just it's a city. It's, it's a municipal sale. municipal tax municipal sale. tax sale. Yeah. So that, that sounds fun. Is that does, this is okay. I expect okay. lots of road cones though. <laughs> And then it's all no, yours. No, no. <laughs> Municipal tag sale. Okay. As an anecdote, in 1980, I was an intern at the town manager's office in Brunswick, Maine, and my first job was to arrange that, just that. <laughs> and and we sold old parking meters that you couldn't open, so they were actually <laughs> they were full were of no money. Use. <laughs> but no, we, and people spent at that time like ten bucks a piece for them. Yeah. We sold like forty of them, and they had basically they were like a door, you know paper weight or a door stopper is what they, they were good cool. for but they were they were the heads of parking meters and so we were like you can use them for a bank but you can't get your money out of them once you, <laughs> <laughs> once you put it's it in there plan. it's a savings plan it's a savings plan it's a savings plan so That's somewhere in the funny. Bath Brunswick Times Reckon I was on the front okay. page holding a parking meter for sale <laughs> okay 20, municipal tax sale put it on the, on the agenda okay alright so thank you we'll bring this back to you with some more information and the bond out lay information as well. Thank you. Oh, Ready? yes. Oh, yes, oh. go ahead. Oh, please sure. do. Um, and I actually was not even here for this, but I just want to say thank you so much for, for, for looking into this. Um, I'm actually new in town, and this is one of the things that I feel Montpelier is lacking, uh, this exact kind of facility as, as shown in the improvements. So thank you for taking this up, and also thank you guys for asking the right questions about sustainability and you know, doing your jobs well, so I appreciate it. <laughs> and what's your name? <laughs> uh, I'm Kevin Webb. I live up on State and Hubbard. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what did you come for? <laughs> uh, actually, um, so I, I met with Glenn at, at Begito's uh, the other morning uh, about the design review, excuse me, design review district, is that what it's called? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was wondering whether the changes uh, to that are actually we're actually going to be discussed tonight. It might have been before I came in. It was actually last night. There was a the planning, planning commission, commission and yeah. held, held the. Hearing. I mistimed it. It's but fine. I, I think it, but yeah. and it will come to will it come to us at any point? Oh yeah. 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 So, so the planning commission and the I think the historic district commission had a workshop. So they'll then and the planning commission will then have a hearing to just you know their own meeting to decide what they're going to do with it, and then it will get forwarded to us for a final action. So there'll be. Other opportunities. So yeah, no hard feelings. Not discussing it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's been interesting. Kevin, so. if I gave you the wrong <laughs> information, which is totally it, possible, sorry. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, on to council reports. Uh, I just immediately just. Uh, if you don't want to start, Donna, well, you don't have to. No, other than the meter sale, made me think of the rotary coat sale that the Kitzmiller. Karen Kitzmiller started as a way to 
to advertise for her campaign. So instead of buying ads, she sponsored a coat sale. And Rotary is taking it over from Warren. He feels no longer able to do it. But it was amazing. We did it through Community National Bank. And we had over 1,000 coats. I want to say like 1,500 of all types and mittens and gloves and scarves. And it opened at 9 o'clock. It was lined up at 8.30 all around the building. Yay, City Hall. Let's just use it. And people came, and they were so gracious. Packed. I mean, more than Macy's parade. Packed. <laughs> But they were all polite for one another, very grateful. And uh, if you have a chance next September, bring your coats to Community National Bank. And we give them out all day the next day. And it's really great. So thank the community for giving the coats and the community for coming and taking the coats. Hope it'll be a warmer winter. Thank you. Uh, I'm not trying to rip off Lynn, but I'll be a rabble rouser <laughs> at 1 o'clock on Saturday. If anybody wants to pop by, I had a couple constituents there. Mentioned liking to be as good as Glenn. So. <laughs> 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 See you there. I prefer to talk about the Celtics, but this city business Saturday, is cool. Just this Saturday. Just this Saturday. Oh. <laughs> uh, Glenn. Um, uh, I encourage anyone who feels like uh, ripping me off, go for it. It's fun. Um, uh, and I'm glad that, uh, Anne, you mentioned the mural on the back of the rec center because it reminded me that I got to go to the Public Art Commission meeting this past Monday for the first time in a long time, and I'm really glad they're chugging along. Uh, I think that we will hear from them shortly uh, with an update, um, but so I won't steal their thunder, but they're doing well, I think, and uh, I'm really glad that they are in existence and enjoying themselves. Um, and I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30. Ashley. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that I know I have not, um, I haven't been, I wasn't at the last meeting and I left early a few times. I've been really sick uh, for like the last six months or so and I'm finally feeling human and great again and I truly appreciate all of your patience. I know it's hard when there's one person that's not here constantly and know that my responses to constituent emails also <laughs> dropped precipitously, um, but I was reading them and I was keeping up with them, and I just want to thank everybody for really just meeting me where I was at at that point, and I'm glad to be back. Great to have you back. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing, just wanted to... Um, prepare you all uh, next week to expect to see the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee coming here with um, a presentation. And so look out for that, um, figuring out kind of next steps and where that group is going. Um, so look forward to that, should be great. Um, one issue that a constituent raised to me was um, the city's use of Facebook as a medium. We had a very interesting exchange about you know, some of Facebook's practices, and he had read the New York Times expose on child pornography and how they're essentially doing protocols now to make it easier to do that kind of thing with encryption. Um, and we all know about the kind of political disinformation campaigns and other things. And so we had a, you know, robust exchange about, you know, the, the value of reaching as many people for safety and welfare and other issues, but also kind of supporting platforms like Facebook, so just wanted to put it out to you all um, that this has been raised. It was an interesting point. Um, also got a really nice note from a constituent about the great mountain biking trails and all the work that's been done and the, a lot of gratitude for the <coughs> crews and the vision and everything that's gone into that, so it was just a really nice um, note to see. So good work to all the folks that are doing that and great to see people using them and you know staying in the community and then using our restaurants and all these good things tied into um, this, this great resource for the community. So I just wanted to share that really nice feedback that we got. And that's it for the book. Great. Uh, so I have a few things. Um, uh, there was a uh, lady in town who approached me about forming a, um, she, well, she was very interested in, in uh, creating a dog park uh, in town, fenced in. And so uh, she was very interested in starting a, a group uh, to, um, explore that, possibly raise money. Um, 
and she was very interested in this being a city committee. I, I um, chatted with Bill briefly about um, does that make sense? <clears throat> As they would have to, uh, you know, keep minutes and follow open meeting law. She's she's still very interested in that being the case. Um, I don't have strong objections to that, um, but then um, I, I think it. I don't have a dog in that race, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you can never guess. <laughs> <my answer. laughs> uh, but I, uh, I think it. Pro before we move forward with that, I think it would probably make sense for us to just check in with the Parks uh, Commission, um, give them a heads up, see if they, um, you know, how that how we want to interface um, on this topic um, with them. But just as a heads up, so that this is a topic that uh, may be coming up, and if they're, I mean, um, if they are going to end up. Uh, raising the money and sort of managing it themselves, uh, then that may mean that, you know, they're going to be looking for a lot of folks to be a part. And so if you hear of anybody who is um, interested in that, uh, you, for now you can send them my way. I'll connect them um, with this lady and we'll, we'll go from there. So that's, um, and yes. on that, do you want me to bring it up next Tuesday's parks meeting? Oh, that would be great, actually. If, okay. If you Anything would. more you want me to know, email me. Sure, that sounds great. And I, um, I may connect you with this lady to coordinate okay. that okay. communication because sure. it well, may also make sense for her to go to. I don't know. <coughs> um, okay. So well, and the other thing too is that it, we might just want to. I don't know if this should be an item on their agenda. Well, we can let them figure that out, obviously, but. Anyway, so yeah, let's be in touch about that. Um, just want to recognize that we had a great opening uh, last Friday uh, for the shared use path. Um, they, I think they were expecting something like 25 people and 75 people showed up. So that was pretty great. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's the Sibui Nebe. It gets two words, river water. Sibui Nebe. Yeah, Sibui, Sibui. Okay. Anyway, so that's that's the name of the path, uh, and it was, that's a the Abenaki word for river water, and uh, there were some representatives there from uh, the Abenaki Nation. That was pretty great to have them be a part of it, um, and yep, so just wanted to make a note about that. Uh, thanks for everybody's hard work um, with the city to make that happen. Um, and then just um, another um, uh, update on the... Uh, home energy labeling um, disc, uh, committee. Uh, we did just take a vote at our most recent meeting to make a recommendation about a, a mechanism um, for uh, the tool that would uh, help a account for uh, the modeling of um, the, the energy. So uh, there's a lot of steps yet to go with that, but we at least have an idea of uh, what tool m we think is going to make sense. Um, anyway, so just more on that um, ongoing. All right, so that is it for me. Uh, John. There's one thing I'm that ready to announce that is really cool, and another thing I'm a little bit further from announcing it. If it happens, it will be incredibly and cool <laughs> and I can't yet I just can't there's a there's a member of the press in the audience it's too next soon Wednesday? Next, Wednesday. next Wednesday very possibly will be the really You're cool the one the Wednesday. super cool <laughs> one's gonna take a little longer I'm write my notes two non-issues <laughs> <laughs> so your news is that there's no news the most apropos there's no news, there's no news. There's no news. almost news you but get no specifically news. no news okay <laughs> Exactly, no story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a story, but I can't tell you. <laughs> Just tune in next week. Same <laughs> bad time, same <laughs> bad show. He could tell us, but then. Yeah, I know. Have to kill us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which would be a, a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with the press. Yeah, I don't think we have a whole extra lot to report other than the stuff we've already gone over. Uh, we are, you know, 
in hiring mode. So we've been starting some interviews for both our positions, uh, finance director and uh, assistant to the city manager. Got some interesting candidates for both. Um, we, as you, you all know, the, uh, the judge made a decision about the appellants, uh, sort of restricting it to two people. So while that's an interesting decision, it still, I think, doesn't really change the time or trajectory of the case or the issues to be raised. Um, let's see, anything else I'm missing? That you can think, of. I'm not trying to, I just. Winter parking? Winter parking, oh, we never heard from Tony. So I'm taking that's good news. So the issue with winter parking ban, so we, we're not talking cryptically. We'll tell you next week. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just have to wait and see every morning if you get a ticket. That's right. Um, as of yesterday, we hadn't received any bids for towing. Um, so I, the chief is going to reach out and let me know before tonight's meeting whether they had resolved that. Um, so if we don't have towing, then the winter parking ban, by almost necessity next week, we would be looking at going back to just the blanket Total. ban because oh. we don't have, we, we can't have a impartial ban and not tow people. Um, and of course we don't really want to do that. So um, he was going to speak with one of the tow companies today and see if that could be worked out and let me know before the meeting, but we've all both been busy and I haven't heard from him. So I don't know, I don't, I don't have anything electronically from him. Perhaps this so will be, oh sorry. That may be on next week's agenda. Uh, perhaps this is an opportunity to expedite the previous plan that we discussed about perhaps starting in January about oh, even I just got a text from Tony saying we are all set with towing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, inside job. <laughs> <laughs> is he watching? <laughs> you, yes, he must be. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Um, okay, well, I, I'll get to that. Okay. So, never mind. <laughs> so, so I, in that, I, taking all of that back, the November 15th is the beginning of the official legal date in the um, ordinance for uh, parking ban. So we will be calling those and people should be aware and we'll try to get information out as usual about what the options are. We'll also have, uh, there are two, two streets that we want to add. There was a Prospect Street I think needs more. We can't really get fire trucks through some of that street so we want to add po a portion of that and Sibley Avenue just from um, Berry Street up to college, that's also too narrow there. So we'll be bringing a first uh, reading of adding those into that parking ordinance at the next meeting. But the ordinance also allows us to sort of, as an emergency call, so we're gonna start sort of including those immediately, but with the idea that we'll change the ordinance so that it's permanent. I guess that's all I have. Uh, is the discussion about potentially alternating sides for the parking ban on the agenda in December? I didn't see it, maybe I just missed we it. didn't have that now, I think. I think it's a fair thing to add. Okay. If we're gonna, I, I mean if. Uh, if we're gonna do it this winter, we better talk about it. Right. I mean, even to consider it. And we can, if we, well, that's soon. That's, yeah. yeah. I, I would also just, as a renter, like trying to find places to live in Montpelier that have parking is really tricky and 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 though a lot of land you know a lot of the selling point is you can park on the street at any time so you don't have to worry so I just if if that does change like I know a lot of people in you know in the block where I used to live would be really impacted so I just want to make sure that we have a really effective get the word out campaign if that's what we need to do um, but it's it, yeah. you know it's, it's a practical reality of living in the Northeast, but I also have been, you know, told by landlords in the area, like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, there's there's on-street parking that doesn't usually become an issue, but the, the yeah, go ahead, Don. Just the, maybe part of the discussion you also missed was just discussing the idea of parking shifting sides of the street year around so they could sweep the street, okay. etc. cetera. But we have fenced ourselves in when we changed our zoning. I remember being a minority and not wanting to reduce the landlord and business's requirement for parking, but we it did it. Right. And so lo and behold, the market is bearing. Yes. And let's hope our parking garage happens. <laughs> That's right. Okay, anything? Yeah, that would help a lot of those issues as far as overnight yeah. winter true. parking. 
Uh, anything further? Uh, all right, so then I think uh, we are at the end. So uh, without objection, we're gonna consider the meeting adjourned. It's only 9.02. Thank you.